Hey, Fireproof, as always, we love you guys. We miss you guys. We wish that, uh, you know, we could be here together. Uh, and I, I'm just so excited for when all this is lifted and we can get back together because we, we of course, don't have anything planned as of right now, you know, because we're just kind of waiting to see when the end of this is. But I can promise you, this summer we're gonna, or, or whenever that time is, we are gonna put some things together uh, to make sure we see you guys, to make sure, of course, that, we, that we're still growing together, um, but also just to spend time together, just times of fellowship, uh, you know, just so we can uh, act goofy and eat snacks and just have a good time and, and increase our fellowship with each other and, and in our community of what Fireproof is. You know, Fireproof is something that means so much to us, and part of that is because we get to be together. And I promise you, whenever this is lifted, we're going to be doing plenty of that. So, you know, whenever that may be, be on the lookout because we've got some cool things that will come up as a result of that. Um, now, of course, this is the Holy Week. This is what we mark as the last week, uh, or we celebrate and commemorate the last week of Jesus' life and his earthly ministry upon this earth. Sunday is Easter. Um, it is such a strange thing to think that this Sunday we're not going to be meeting together as a congregation. We're not meeting here together on this Wednesday. But there's a few things that I'm going to highlight in this lesson today that do not change. Just because we're not meeting, it does not take away any effect of our salvation or anything along those lines. Um, so I, I just want to remind you all, uh, even before we get in, I'm kind of spoiling the story. Jesus' victory is as assured today as it was, you know, close to 2,000 years ago uh, when he resurrected from the grave. He, he's still victorious. He's still triumphant. Um, and that's what we're celebrating this week. Um, so as you guessed, I'm going to be reading some scripture for you related to that Easter story. I'm not going to read all of it. I'm going to summarize quite a bit of it. Um, but make sure that during this week you, you, you focus. If you've not already been listening to my pleas for you uh, to prioritize your spiritual health, please listen to it. This week this is the Holy Week. This is the week where we celebrate the last week of Jesus' life. This is the week that we celebrate above all, all that Jesus did for us which, as we're getting ready to hear, includes uh, being beaten, being mocked, being spit on, uh, being killed on a cross, uh, being buried in the ground, and then rising back again to life. So if you've not been listening to my pleas to you uh, to prioritize your spiritual health, please listen to it now. It is so important. Uh, when all this is over, there's the best thing you can do is to look back on it and say, you know what, that time wasn't good, but I was able to use it to grow closer in my relationship with the Lord. And I really want all of us to be able to say that. That applies not just to our teens, but to our adults watching this as well. I'm going to have a word of prayer. We're going to be in Mark chapter 15. Um, <clears throat> of course, there's many passion accounts. There's many narratives. Every gospel has one. Um, and, and, you know, they, they agree on the most central aspects. And then there's some different details and, and things that are included in some and emphasized um, that aren't in others. We're specifically going to be looking at Mark's uh, account of the Passion narrative. It's the one that's believed to be the earliest written of all the gospel accounts. So Mark chapter 15. Um, turn there with me in just a second. First, let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, I thank you so much for all that you are and all that you do. God, I want to thank you for your love um, that is displayed so evidently in all the things of this world. And Father, there is nothing uh, that has been done or that will be done that's more evidently a display of your love than you giving us your son, Jesus. And Father, there's nothing that could ever be more evidently displayed of his love for us than his death upon the cross. Because God, we know that he did that willingly. Father, hopefully we commemorate that every single day of our lives. But Father, especially during this week, the Holy Week leading up to Easter. Father, I pray that we prioritize our relationship with you. And Father, one of the best ways we can do that is to express to you our gratitude for Jesus and all that he's done for us. <clears throat> so Father, I pray that we take the next couple minutes. It's going to be brief. God, I pray that we take just the next few minutes just to, to, to put aside every other distraction. God, I pray that you clear each and everything from our head that's trying to distract us, that's trying to nag at us, that's trying to uh, get us to not focus on the scripture and not focus on Jesus' sacrifice. God, help us to play, pay our full attention to you. Help it not to seem like this is just some video in which I'm speaking and everyone's listening, but this is a joint effort for all of us to grow closer to you. Father, we love you. We thank you. <clears throat> it's in your son's name that I pray. So as I mentioned, we're going to be in Mark chapter 15. I'm going to be jumping around just a little bit and summarize some certain points. Um, now, we know that near the end of Jesus' life, um, I preached this last Sunday. I don't know if you might have watched. Hopefully you did. It's available on YouTube if not. Um, we talked about the triumphal entry in which Jesus is paraded into the city of Jerusalem. 
Um, he's paraded as the people's idea of a king. They thought he was going to be a king like King David. He was going to be a warrior. He's going to come like a sword in hand. He's going to strike down the Romans. He's going to do all this powerful stuff. And we know that just a few short days later, not only is that image of Jesus not realized, we have this image in which he's willingly handing himself over to the authorities. So people paraded him into town thinking he was going to come with some big sword and strike down Caesar and all these terrible things against the Romans. And instead, we see him not pick up a sword, but offer out his hands. Offer out his hands for them to be bound by the authorities so that he would be arrested. And we know eventually led to his death. And so there's a lot of things that are chronicled in the last you know, two days or so of Jesus' life after his arrest, before his death upon the cross. Now in Mark chapter 15, as we start there, I'm going to read the first uh, 15 verses because uh, it's one of my favorite accounts that's listed within all of the passion narrative, which is what I mean is the last week of Jesus' life leading to his death and resurrection. <clears throat> Mark chapter 15, And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away, and they delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, Have you no answer to make? Do you see how many charges they have brought against you? But Jesus made no further answer, so Pilate was amazed. And now at the feast, he used to release, now at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in the prison who had committed murder in an insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them to say, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have them release Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man that you call the king of the Jews? And the crowd begins to cry out, Crucify him. And Pilate says, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. And so Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Now that's a really, really powerful uh, scene. Let's not just do that thing where we read something and then just, wow, that's too bad, and then just move past it. Imagine yourself for a moment that you're in that crowd. Imagine for yourself for a moment. So Pilate was the Roman governor, and Jesus was brought before him. He had been paraded in these fake trials. There was no uh, grounds of evidence that could hold any charge against him. He was being falsely accused of all the things, and Pilate knew that. And so when they were brought before him, Pilate offered Jesus the opportunity to defend himself. He says, these people are saying you're a blasphemer, that you're saying you're the king of the Jews. Are you the king of the Jews? And all Jesus said is, you've said so, which is kind of cryptic. He could have said so many things, but instead he, spoke, he chose to spoke very, speak very simply on the matter. Once again, Pilate asked him, he says, do you not have any answer to make? Pretty much he's saying, do you not realize that I hold your life in my hands? I'm the only one with the power to free you, and I also hold the power to condemn you. Now, he doesn't say that exactly, but we kind of can get that uh, vibe from, from, from Pilate, that he's kind of letting Jesus know, if there's anyone you want to defend yourself to, it's me. And we know that Jesus does it. In verse 5, it says, Jesus made no further answer. And Pilate was amazed. Pilate was probably amazed because he's used to people falling on the, their knees in front of him and begging for their lives and saying, you've got to understand, I'm innocent. I didn't do this, blah, 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 blah. And Jesus is not going to defend himself or his divinity or his ministry and his purpose uh, and his mission that God has put within him to anybody. And it says that Pilate was amazed. And so there's one more little thing here. And, and this is that part that is so powerful. And I just want you to imagine for a moment that you're in the crowd and you're witnessing this. Uh, it, it says at the time of the feast, um, Pilate had this tradition, and he would take one prisoner from amongst the Jews, and he would release them. Just completely pardon from their sin. Uh, it doesn't matter what you've done. You're free to go. You're free from it. It's kind of an example of a way in which he would just kind of show a mercy, where he would release them from the punishment, uh, from, from whatever it is that they had reaped because of their wrongs. It says among the people that were in prison was a man named Barabbas, and he had committed murder. And there was evidence against him. So Jesus, no evidence of any uh, you know, claims or accusations. And then Barabbas, who was a known murderer and a known rebel against the Roman state. 
Right? This was a bad guy. This is not the kind of guy that you want to have released amongst your people. And he asked, he says, you can have one person freed to you. Do you not want it to be this man who is one, as you might call him, the king of the Jews? Now, unfortunately, that probably did not help Jesus' case. Because one of the main charges against Jesus was that of blasphemy. It was saying he was making claims and attributing things about himself that no man could make. He was already making statements that were blasphemous or inappropriate or even sinful for him to make. And so when, when, when uh, Pilate says, do you want this man? He's your king. Why do you not want your king to be released? That angered the, some of the leaders within the crowd even more and says that they go throughout the crowd and they turn everyone against Jesus even further. And they start chanting that they want Barabbas. The people have so fully rejected Jesus, they would rather a known murderer walk free amongst them than to have Jesus, who did nothing but promote peace and foster love and, and, and respect and, and, and just things like that. He did all these good and wonderful things throughout his ministry and served others, but the people so fully rejected him that they wanted Barabbas. And so Pilate at this point is probably flabbergasted. What am I supposed to do with these people? And so he says, well, what do you want me to do with the one that you call the king of the Jews? What do you want me to do with Jesus? And it says the crowd starts to chant, crucify him. Now, I mentioned at the beginning, and I've made this comparison before, um, the triumphal entry in which Jesus is paraded into the city um, as a king. And I mentioned Sunday, um, the people had their own expectations of what a king might look like. They wanted a warrior. They wanted someone tough. They wanted someone who was not going to take anything from anybody, and they were going to oppress the Roman people. And we had people um, that they, they were shouting all these wonderful things about Jesus. They were proclaiming him to be the king that they had been waiting on. And then just a few short later, a few short days later, you have a crowd turn against him so fully that they say, crucify him. Verse 15, it says, so Pilate, who wished to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas and had Jesus scourged or, or beaten and whipped and mocked and all these different things. And then he delivered him to be crucified. Now, the next couple verses, it actually tells about some of the mockeries that they made of Jesus. They, they made for him a crown of thorns. You know, what should be a symbolism of royalty, they made a crown of thorns so it would hurt him. And they pressed it down upon his head. And as they pressed it even further, I'm sure you could see the blood run down his temples and run down his head. Now, remember some of the symbols from the triumphal entry. You had palm branches. You had uh, cloaks being thrown at their feet. You had him riding in on a donkey. And there's all these signs uh, of kingship that Jesus is the king. And a few short days later, these signs of kingship are no, are no longer being attributed to him as if he's some leader they've been waiting on. But they're using them to mock him. It says they clothed him in a purple cloak. And for a long time in this world, purple has been a color and symbol of royalty and majesty. And so once they got him all beaten up and bloodied and the crown of thorns upon his head, they took a purple cloak and they wrapped him in it. And that's just adding insult to injury. That is kicking a dog while it's down. It says they began to salute him and they stood before him and they said, Hail to the king of the Jews. So just a few days ago, we had people saying, Hosanna, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And they're throwing palm branches at his feet. And they are assuring that he's going to have victory. And then a few days later, they are mocking him as he's bloodied on the ground and saying, Hail to the king of the Jews. And they continued to beat him. They continued to throw curses at him and spit on him. And then they led him away to be crucified. It tells us that he carried his own cross on his back as he walked towards the spot of his crucifixion. It was, it was placed across his back. At one point, it tells us that it was too heavy and someone had to physically help him carry it. That's how weakened he had become. That's how much they had beaten and mocked and hurt him. It's, it's he didn't even have the energy to carry his own cross anymore. And someone had to assist him in that. It says they take him to this hill and they stand the cross up and there he hung. Now, crucifixion uh, is the most brutal and painful and disgusting way that the Romans could come up with to execute a criminal. And that's what they did. Um, that, that's what they used crucifixion for, was for criminals and, and, and bad criminals, ones they wanted to make an example out of. So you think this was not just an effort for them to kill Jesus. They didn't just want to inflict pain and shame upon him, though they certainly did. They also wanted to make an example out of him. If you're going to act like this, if you were going to oppress the Roman state, if you were going to cause trouble, if you were going to be a leader of a rebellion, this is what is going to happen to you. 
We know that a few short hours after he's hung upon this cross and his, uh, you know, his, his blood's falling to the ground, he's soaked with sweat and with tears, and all his disciples except for John has abandoned him, and, and his mother and these, these other uh, women from his ministry, they're there, and they're all trying to console each other, and it is in that situation in which Jesus breathed his last. We know that he is taken from that spot, and he doesn't even have a tomb of his own to be buried in. And so they have to bury him in a borrowed tomb, one that would belong to another family. And so they had to put him in there, and that would have been just the darkest day imaginable. And I hope as I'm telling this story, you're putting yourself into the story. Not necessarily as a specific character, but that you're just witnessing it. That you're playing these images out in your head of the crowd chanting, crucify him. We want Barabbas. Crucify Jesus. We hate him. We do not want him. We fully reject him. And I want you to imagine that you can see as he's being beaten and mocked in the purple robe and the crown of thorns. And imagine that you were present at the crucifixion. And now I want you to imagine just for a moment that he's been buried in this tomb. And this giant stone has been rolled in front of the tomb. And the tomb is sealed. And then there's nothing. There's, there's no noise. You know, you might be waiting for some big explosion. And he kicks the door down and comes flying out. In that moment, there was nothing. If nobody was speaking or moving, there would have been complete and utter silence. And for Jesus' disciples and for those that were around him, that loved him, that's probably all they could feel in that moment. I would imagine that would be a time when the silence would have been deafening. Because they think, what are we going to do now? This man that we have devoted our lives to following, the one we gave everything away, put all our, th all our career and everything on hold to follow, well, he's dead in that tomb over there. And it doesn't look like he's coming out of it. But we know that that dark, dark day that we now call Good Friday in which Jesus was killed and buried in the tomb, we know that that dark day is not the end of the story. I'm going to jump now to Mark chapter 16, and I'm going to read just a few verses for you from that account. When the Sabbath was passed, this means on the third day later is what I'll say, on, we'll say Sunday. On the, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. That means they're preparing Jesus' body uh, just for this burial process and what's going to happen. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for, for us from the entrance of the tomb? Now I'm going to stop for a second. These, these women were doing their faithful duty. They were still trying to minister even to Jesus' body after his death. But you can see in verse 3, they did not expect him to be gone. They fully expected him to be there because they were talking amongst themselves. Well, who's going to open the door? Who's going to move the stone that is in front of the tomb? How on earth are we going to get in there? But then we know in verse 4, they saw something miraculous. It says, and looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. And it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed, for you seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. But he has risen, and he is not here. See the place where they laid him, but go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. And then there is a few more verses to finish up Mark chapter 16, uh, in, in which there's uh, Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene and to a couple of the disciples, and, and then the disciples get involved and they know what's going on. But I want to stop there for just a moment. Imagine, once again, that you are with this uh, kind of band of ladies that are coming to do this ministry, even to Jesus' body, after his death. You're, you're concerned how you're going to get into the tomb, and then you look up. And you notice the stone has already been rolled away. And you see uh, a man that's dressed in white. And I would imagine it was, it's a white unlike we had seen. It's not like eggshell that we paint our walls with. This was probably a white and a brightness and a light that just radiated in an unhuman way. Because this wasn't a human. This was some angel. This was some heavenly messenger. And deliver a message he did. He says to them, and I love this. This is one of the most powerful couple of verses. One of the most powerful passages in all of scripture. Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified, but he has risen and he is not here. See the place where they laid him. He says, you're seeking Jesus. You are looking for the living amongst the dead, but he is already gone. 
There is life. There, there is no longer death in this tomb uh, because life came back to his body and he is gone. He is not here any longer. It says you can even come and see right where he was laid. You can see where he laid just a few short hours ago and now he's gone. But the ladies, their job wasn't done. They didn't just uh, end the story right there. The angel tells them, but go and tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. And there you will see him just as he told you. So their job wasn't done. They were able to see this angelic messenger and hear this message. And then he says, but now you've got work to do. You've got to go tell the disciples. You've got to go tell Peter specifically. And you've got to go prepare to meet him. Because just as he told you he was coming back, he is coming back. And so it's, we know that eventually they go off and they join the disciples. And, and, and here we are now, a couple thousand years later, and this message of Jesus of Nazareth, the risen Christ, the risen Lord, is still alive and active. And we are still doing our part to share this. Because I want to tell you, in my life, I wasn't there that morning that the stone was rolled away, but I have experienced the risen Jesus of Nazareth in my life, and I've devoted my life to him. And so this is my attempt to tell you all um, that he is alive this morning. He is alive and active. He is at the right hand of the throne of God. And he is advocating for us on our behalf. He's doing things for us that we cannot do for ourselves. And what I mean by that is that we cannot gain salvation on our own. We have to have him. We have to have the blood of his sacrifice applied to our lives and applied to our sin. If we have had that, if we have expressed um, the, the, that He is our Lord, that He is our Savior, we have asked for forgiveness, and we have faithfully done our best to repent of our sinful and wicked ways, then we have that. We have His victory and His triumph. And we know that one day, when our bodies fail and we pass from this world, there will be a resurrection that we will take part in. It's not because we're awesome or not, it's not because we've done something fantastic. It is only because of the victory and the power of Jesus and his sacrifice. Y'all, please don't forget that. That's the most important thing I could share from the most important week that this world has ever saw. It wasn't just Jesus was alive for just a minute or two, and now that's all done and over with, and we find something else to do. Jesus is still alive and active and influencing the world and saving people even today. And Fireproof, if, if, if you don't have that salvation, if you don't have a knowledge of who Jesus is, that he's your Lord and Savior and he loves you and he cared enough about you to die for you, then I pray that you know that this evening. I pray that as you listen to this, if you feel God tugging on your heart, if you feel a conviction that you walk forward, that you accept it, that you understand that you're not trying to be shamed or guilted into coming into a relationship with Jesus. But that people love you enough to continue to tell this message because that's how important it is. What I just shared with you is the most important thing that I could possibly ever share with you. There's nothing I could ever say that will trump what I just told you here. That Jesus was, he was killed, he was buried, but he rose again by the power of God within him. I want to just continue um, to offer an invitation. I know, I know that we can't come to the altar and all that, but if you have questions... If you know that you are ready to answer that call that is being placed to you and on your behalf and you want to tell somebody who will celebrate you, celebrate with you, please call, please text, please message me because I want to know that. Because I want to join in your celebration. I want to welcome you as a new brother and sister into the family of God. That invitation is open. It's not just Wednesday at 6 o'clock or Sunday at 11 o'clock. God's invitation is into your life is always open and Jesus' sacrifice can always be applied to you. But you have to accept it. Um, there's a, a part of this process called repentance in which we have to ask for forgiveness from our sins, um, but then also we turn away from the sinful and wicked things. We don't continue down a path of wickedness and just say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and, and there's no turning away from that path. The good news is we don't have to forge our own path because Jesus will place our feet one after another and he will give us the steps on the path that we need. But we have to be willing to let it. Uh, let, let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for all that you are and all that you do. God, I thank you for this message and how important it is. God, I pray um, this is not just a message that we celebrate in the Holy Week, but Father, I pray just an intensity is turned up in this week. Father, Father that the, the, the conviction is on people hot and heavy. God, that if they've never experienced you because they have, to this point, rejected the salvation or the sacrifice of Jesus. Father, I pray that they come to know you. 
Father, I pray that we do not reject the sacrifice of Jesus because that's what we do uh, if, if we deny this relationship with you. That's the only way that we can have a relationship with you is if we acknowledge Jesus' sacrifice in our life, we realize that we cannot do it on our own, and we accept him as our Lord and our Savior. Father, I pray that there are none that hear this message and, and, and none around this world that can hear that gospel message and turn away from it. Father, I pray that if there's any um, who have rejected it, Father, I pray that they don't harden their hearts, that they understand that that offer is still available to them. And God, I pray that they accept it um, while they still have the opportunity. Father, I thank you for Fireproof. I'm so thankful for this group of teens. And Father, I truly believe that they know how important all this is. God, I don't think that they take that uh, lightly. But Father, I pray that we don't take it for granted. That we know that salvation was not free. Um, it, it did not come at a small cost. It was the greatest cost that we could ever imagine. It cost Jesus his life, and it cost God his son. And Father, I pray that we understand that our salvation wasn't free, and that we live in a way that reflects that. Father, we love you. We thank you. It's in your son's name that I pray. Amen. Um, Fireproof, if you have any questions about anything that you've heard tonight, uh, even if you, th you say, well, I've heard this story, I know it, you know, blah, 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 it doesn't matter. If you have any questions whatsoever, if you want to talk, if you want to be comforted about something, if you want me to pray with you about something you've heard today, please message me. Please message one of our adult leaders because, like I said, that is what we are here for. Not just because uh, scripture says it, though that is good enough, but we can experience the fact that Jesus is alive and he still influences lives and he is still winning hearts over to God. He is still establishing it so people can have relationships with their father who created them. Jesus is alive and he is active. And I'm so, so, so thankful. That on that uh, third day, when those ladies went to faithfully do their duty, they found that the stone was not still in place, that it had been rolled away, and Jesus' body was no longer there. Because they were looking for the living amongst the dead, and he had been powerfully resurrected back to life. Church, we love you. Fireproof, we love you. If you need anything, let us know.